So, you've either just got your new shiny, shiny home or you're thinking about buying one. And then a dreadful question hits your mind. How in hell do I charge this thing? This is a charger. <coughs> charging station. And this is also a charging station. But so's this. And so's this. So do I need one of these at home? Or do I need one of these at home? Don't worry. Today, we're going to help you discover what you do need to charge your EV, both at home and on the road. And we're gonna cover the very, very basics. We gotcha. Throughout this video, we're going to pop the chargeway colors and numbers up like this. Partly because we like the chargeway system and partly because we think it simplifies charging. And because we're trying to make this video broadly applicable, this video does have some chunks that are more relevant to a North American audience and some chunks that are for Kiwis, Europeans and Australians. We'll be flagging the bits that you can skip, like this next bit, which folks outside North America might want to hop over. With North America being a little behind on the whole EV thing, it's allowed multiple connectors to fight it out for marketplace dominance. And last year, we think we saw the resolution. Pretty much every manufacturer, even those that are currently not producing EVs, have settled on the North American charging standard, or NACS for short. But right now, we still have two home charging connectors to choose from. So the first and most important thing for charging at home is to make sure that if you do buy a charger other than the one that comes with your car, it either has to be compatible with your vehicle or have a relevant adapter for it. This is the charging plug currently used by most EVs except Tesla. It's called J1772. If you live in North America and you have a Tesla, you'll have a NAX charging plug. That's commonly called the Tesla connector, but it's also got a shiny new name. J3400. Sorry. From essentially 2024, all manufacturers are going to be providing NAX compatibility. And from 2025, the majority of vehicles in the US will come with NAX inlets on the vehicles. So adapters this year and actual inlets next. But between then and now, there will be adapters to allow you to convert NAX to J1772 and J1772 to NAX for most cars on the market. Exactly which older vehicles will work with those is a little vague right now. And you may need an app, but we still don't know. It's up in the air. And now, North Americans, you can skip forwards a few seconds. If you live in Europe, Australia or Aotearoa, you'll have a charging cable that ends in something that looks like this, which is called Type 2. It has a couple of extra pins that the US connector lacks because of differences between countries that run on 110-ish volts versus Europe and Aotearoa and Australia, which runs on 220-ish volts. Once your charger is plugged into an outlet and it's turned on its little ready light, it is literally just a case of plugging the connector into the socket on the car. And that's it. Oh. In Europe, a lot of cars require you to lock the vehicle to start charging, but then that's it. Ask me how ridiculous the EV journalist looked the first time she went back to the UK and took several minutes to work out how to start charging her rental car. Some vehicles, like Tesla, will open a charging flap automatically when you wave a charging cable that's made by Tesla at it, or in fact, a flipper zero. Some cars have a button that you press to open the charging flap, either in the vehicle or outside, just the same as you would find on most ICE vehicles. And mobiles like my lovely Raven here, they are fully manual. Now, the observant among you will have noticed there's another pair of pins hiding under the cover here, and we'll talk more about that later. If you're thinking there's more to this, 
I mean, yeah, there's, there's lots more optional things you can do with charging stations. The charging stations Kate has at her house are set up to give her an estimate of electricity costs, as are mine, but mine are also set up with Home Assistant, so I can automate and change my charge rate depending on what else is going on. But if you just want the car to charge, then at this point you're done, and you can go inside and enjoy a cup of coffee. Let's answer a question that comes up a lot, and we get it asked a lot when we do presentations on EVs. Can you plug in and charge when it's hot or sunny or wet or snowing or otherwise really nasty outside? Yes. Yes, you can. I have personally plugged in during cats and dogs deluges. I have plugged in in snow and I have stood in a puddle and plugged in. I've plugged into this very charging station when it was nearly 40 degrees Celsius. That's what, 110 degrees Fahrenheit? I've also plugged in when it's well below freezing. Don't always enjoy the weather, but the car just charges. That's because there are a lot of safety checks that go on before the car tells the little box on your wall or the box hanging off a inlet to let electricity flow. And modern EVs have a ton of special gadgetry to keep the battery happy that makes sure it stays warm enough or cold enough so that you're safe to plug in whatever the weather and the battery stays healthy. Okay, so now the car's charging, you might be wondering what all those charges were right at the beginning. Before we delve into that though, there are a few important things to know. The first thing is about how you measure energy. For electric vehicles, we measure that in a couple of different ways. The first is kilowatts for, for charging. You can think of kilowatts as being how quickly the petrol is being pumped into your tank in an internal combustion engine vehicle. The other way we measure energy is in kilowatt hours, which is kind of the equivalent of gallons or liters equivalent in uh, internal combustion engine tank. So kilowatts is how quickly and, and kilowatt hours is how much or how full. Okay, so that was thing one. Thing two is that how fast your vehicle can charge at any specific moment basically depends on three things. One is how fast the charger you've plugged into is capable of charging. That is how many kilowatts it can provide. The second is how fast the car itself can charge. That's how many kilowatts it can use to charge. And the final thing is how full the battery is. Generally, how full the battery is governs how fast the vehicle will charge. So if it's really full, it's going to charge slower. So let's give you some examples. It will all make sense, I promise. The Chevrolet Bolt EV has a 66 kilowatt hour battery pack, 65 kilowatt hours usable, and that's the how much. But it can only charge at a rate of up to 55 kilowatts in perfect conditions. That's how quick. It's why a 0 to 80% charge on a Chevrolet Bolt EV takes about 45 minutes on a really good day. And for that, you'll get about 80% of the car's maximum range. The Ford F-150 Lightning Extended Range, to pick another example we have on our fleet, has 131 kilowatt hours of usable battery capacity but it can actually charge at speeds of up to 170 kilowatts, which is honestly why you can charge that larger pack quicker. Although given how inefficient the truck is compared to the hatchback, the ranges aren't that different in the real world. And the final thing to know, that's thing three for those keeping count, is that for this whole section, we're going to talk about results for a typical vehicle. By that, I mean your average EV hatchback, saloon, crossover, or SUV. Because just like gas cars, EVs vary in efficiency. So the amount of miles you get from a particular number of kilowatt hours of electricity is going to vary. But the vast majority of not trucks and not high performance cars sit somewhere around the three to four ish miles per kilowatt hour, roughly 21 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers region, which is why the Bolt EV, to use that example again, gets just shy of 240 miles from its 65 
kilowatt hour usable pack. So let's talk about portable charge cables, sometimes called granny cables in some markets. This first one here is called level one. If you are in Europe, Australia, Aotearoa, or anywhere else that runs on around 200 plus volts AC, you can go ahead and skip this bit because it's just for countries that are using 110 volts or thereabouts. Like I said, these are sometimes called granny leads or trickle charging cords, and they used to come for free with most EVs. And sometimes you still will get one. They plug into a regular 110 volt household outlet and will charge a typical EV at three to five miles per hour that the car is plugged in. Although the F-150 Lightning, yeah, that's about 1.3 miles per hour if you're using this. That doesn't sound like a lot and it isn't, but if you're driving a regular average EV and your daily commute is around or under the US average, which is about 40 miles or 65 kilometers, and you don't do a lot of driving beyond that, you'd probably be just fine with one of these. The only other thing to note is that like most things that plug into the electrical outlet, you need to keep an eye on the quality and condition of the plug and make sure that you're using a good quality, known good outlet. Good quality level one chargers like this should monitor the wall plug to make sure it doesn't get too hot. And this is important since these things can continuously pull eight to 10 amps from a socket at 110 to 120 volts. So an outlet that's been on the outside of your house, hidden and corroding underneath a plant for the last 50 years, shouldn't be your first port of call to plug one of these in at. Like I say, one of these will usually give you 30 to maybe 50 miles of range over a 10 hour overnight charge. Welcome back Europeans, Aussies, Kiwis and everyone else with a 200 plus volt electrical system. North Americans, I'm afraid you don't get to skip class this time. And this one is also for you because this next type of charger that you're going to encounter is the level two charger, which is the lowest power charger that you'll find outside North America. These can look like the level ones, by which I mean they can look like a box on a cord with a plug attached to it, or they can be permanently installed, like the one we showed you outside. They can be wired in, or sometimes they plug into, in North America, a NEMA 1430, a 1440, or a 1450 outlet, or in 200 plus volt places, an outlet. These kinds of chargers have a huge range of power outputs from around 4 to around 11 kilowatts or about 35 miles, that's 55 kilometers for each hour on charge for a typical EV. And in Europe, because they have three phase power, they can run up to around 22 kilowatts or around 70 miles, that's about 110 kilometers for each hour on charge. While here in North America, at the moment, most level two charging stations come with a charging cord attached, in Europe and in some other markets, you're expected to bring your own cable. You might want to invest in a glove or some wipes and a bag for that charging cable though, because it's going to get dirty sitting outside while you're charging. And then you're going to have to put that potentially wet and dirty object in your car. The frunk is usually a good spot if your car has one. There are very, few people with off-street parking for whom one of those kind of chargers won't work. And you'll find them not just installed at homes, but also at places of work and out in public places like the mall. Remember how I said they were called J1772? Or as we've pocketed up on screen, green two. Well, if you pick your phone's charging application and either filter by J1772 or green two, you'll see a lot of them around. These have been around a long time and sometimes they're free, sometimes they cost money to use and are useful if you are parked up for a significant amount of time. Although some of the older networks, they've gone bust and the charging infrastructure is still there. So your mileage may vary. For those using NACs, they will look like this and they will be called Red 2 and public ones are sometimes called destination chargers. Like we mentioned back at the beginning, 
adapters exist, which means that if you have a Nax car, you can use a J1772 with an adapter, and for most J1772 vehicles, you can use a Nax charger with an adapter. If you're lucky enough to charge at home, and you have time of use electricity rates, or you have solar panels and you only want to charge your EV when you're generating power on the roof of your home, or you have some other charging requirement that means you have to charge at a specific time. Pretty much every electric vehicle on sale today allows you to set some kind of charge timers. Although how easily those timers can be set varies greatly depending on the vehicle. And depending on the type of charging station you have, you may also be able to set it there, or indeed link it to your solar system, or even to tell it to change its charge rate depending on how green the electricity grid is at any given moment. That's what I've done for my own home. But all of that is well outside the realm of this video, so we're not going to delve into it. We just wanted to let you know it's possible, and we've made videos on the channel already talking about it. Right. So what about those big boxes we were stood by right at the beginning? Those are called rapid chargers or superchargers. Sometimes people call them level three chargers, which is a made up term that makes engineers very angry. So I don't recommend using that term. It really doesn't mean anything and gets super confusing. Don't upset the engineers. You wouldn't want to get them angry. You wouldn't like it when, when they're angry. Now, rapid chargers have also been around a long time, and what's considered rapid, well, that varies a lot. Technically, anything from 25 kilowatts up to, at the moment, around 500 kilowatts can be classed as a rapid charger. Fast charger. Yeah, depending on who you talk to and where you are. And like we said earlier, how fast you can charge depends on both the car and the charger, and frankly, the weather. Hmm. This is where things really get a tiny bit more complicated, so maybe we should talk about this a little more in detail. All right, fast charging, or rapid charging. It's a nebulous mess. If you happen to live in parts of the world where your government agreed upon a rapid or fast charging standard years ago, you can skip this bit. Because this first bit is just for those of us who are lucky enough to live in North America. Freedom! Yeah. Things are much simpler in Europe, where with the exception of the Nissan Leaf and a handful of other EVs that are no longer in production, there's just been one plug and has been for a really long time. Pretty much all manufacturers in North America have now settled on NAX or J3400 to use its shiny new name and are transitioning, even in red states, to the shiny new connector starting this year. But at the moment, there are still cars using three different types of rapid charging standards. If you already own a car, that means that all that really matters is the connector it has and the connector you need to find at the rapid charging station are the same, because otherwise you're going to have problems. Those three connectors are NAX, or J3400, CCS and CHAdeMO, and all three of them provide rapid charging. CCS is currently the one with the highest peak power, up to around 500 kilowatts, although no vehicles in the US can make use of all of that. That power comes through those two chunky extra pins we showed you underneath the J1772 connector right at the start. The main reason we mention them is that some older EVs have J1772, that's the slower charging standard we showed you earlier with an outlet that looks like this, but they don't have those two extra pins to rapid charge with CCS. Those cars can't use a rapid charger at all and some EVs were sold for a while with the option of a regular J1772 or a CCS Type 2. The Chevrolet Bolt was one such vehicle. The Nax connector is also pretty darn quick at 350 kilowatts, which is what Tesla's V4 superchargers can deliver right now. 
although that's set to go up quite a bit in the near future. And while Chidemo can technically deliver 400 kilowatts, there are no cars on the US or European market using Chidemo that can charge faster than about 100 kilowatts. If you're considering a car purchase and you're planning to do any long distance road trips, then we would recommend you buy a car with either CCS or NEX. Those of you who were paying attention at the beginning will remember that we said you can get adapters to go from J1772 and NEX and vice versa. At the moment, you can also get a special converter to allow you to use a CCS charging station to charge a NAX vehicle, like a Tesla. That would allow you to charge a Tesla at a CCS, that's Chargeway Green, station. There are also connectors allowing you to do the opposite, but they're not on the market yet. We have a sneaky peeky one right here. They'll be appearing later this year, but before you rush out and buy one, we would strongly recommend getting one that your car's manufacturer approves as well as the charging networks, because charging providers have basically said they're going to introduce clauses into their user agreements that say you have to use an OEM approved adapter, or they might ban you from the network. For those of you old enough to remember Betamax versus VHS, or Genesis versus Nintendo, or even HD versus Blu-ray, back when we had physical media, this is basically the same thing again. Chidemo is a great system, but the only vehicles using it now are the Nissan LEAF and the Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid, and that means that increasingly rapid charging networks are dropping it from their sites. Often sites only have one Chidemo charger anyway, so if anything happens to that charger and you're driving a Chidemo car on a long road trip, you might be a bit stuck. However, good news is on the way because, well, there's a lot of Chidemo compatible cars out in the wild and companies have realized this and multiple companies are now coming up with special adapters allowing you to go from CCS to Chidemo. They're already available in some markets, they're coming soon in others, but yeah, if you want to be able to keep using your Nissan Leaf or Mitsubishi Imiev, certainly well worth you investing some money in one. In general, if you're taking a long road trip, rapid chargers are the chargers you'll use to top up the vehicle on the way. Most, but not all modern EVs have a reasonably solid route planning, so when you put your destination in, the car will add chargers to your route. They are getting better at identifying the fastest chargers, and some, again, not all, have the ability to check how many chargers at a given site are in use, and whether any of them are broken. If your car doesn't do that, or its route planning software isn't great, then the website and app, A Better Route Planner, is great. Um, the website's good. But the app is um, making progress, as, as our teachers used to say. If you'd like us to make a video on route planning, let us know either by reaching out to us on Mastodon or in our Discord chat room or on Patreon if you're a supporter of the channel. Yeah, it costs as little as $1 a month or $10.08 a year. You get a discount if you pay yearly. As we mentioned earlier, the speed you'll get from a rapid charger depends on both the charging speed the car can manage, which is typically anywhere between 55 kilowatts for something like the Chevrolet Bolt EV in really good weather, uh, maybe up to something like 340 kilowatts for something really fancy like the Lucid Air. How charged the car is and the capabilities of the charger. So, for example, if you plug in your shiny new Chevrolet Bolt EV with its maximum charging speed of 55 kilowatts into a 350 kilowatt charger, you're still only going to get 55 kilowatts. And if you plug in your fancy Lucid Air with super fast charging capabilities into a 50 kilowatt rapid charger, guess what? You're still going to get 50 kilowatts. Oh, and you really must let the Smith Farrows know that we are absolutely not coming to another one of their appalling events. They're just so... Oh, oh, I'm terribly sorry. Terribly sorry. How good of you to join me. I just wanted to give you a little etiquette note. Just like you wouldn't want to be caught using your 
I don't know, a fish knife to cut into your jellied salad. It's generally considered rather unmannerly to plug a slower charging vehicle into a faster charger when another charger at the site can provide your maximum charging speed and obviously is available. So uh, if your chauffeur is taking you somewhere in, say, a Volkswagen ID4, which has a maximum charge rate of 135 kilowatts, if you arrive at a site with a 150 and a 350 kilowatt charger both being available, it would be most appropriate for him to plug into the 150 kilowatts. Well, obviously plug the car in. You wouldn't want him to plug himself in and get electrocuted. Not again. Anyway, you wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of Mrs. Lambert with her Audi e-tron now, would you? She might not invite you to the annual peasant luncheon, and that would... Well, it would be most dispiriting. Anyway, thank you for indulging me. I must get back to berating my staff now. Jeeves! Jeeves! Have you seen the state of this table? Like the payment system on each company's gas pumps are all a little bit different, the same is true for payment on each company's rapid charger. Typically they want you to plug in and pay either through the car automatically being linked to your account and paying, which NAX vehicles all do at NAX chargers, at least at Tesla's ones, and CCS cars equipped with plug and charge can do at plug and charge chargers or they want you to pay by using a credit card on the reader, on the machine, or by using an app. And in Europe, the law has just changed to mandate a new set of standards to make charging far easier to pay for. You can use a QR code that's dynamic for low speed charging, think level two, or you can use a card reader or some other payment method for higher speed charging. Although, at this point, I should note that when it comes to screens and charging station reliability, they often get vandalised. I've run into chargers several times where some fool has smashed the screen and or the card reader. And that's meant that more than once, a smartphone app, or in fact plug and charge, has come to my rescue and allowed me to charge in a situation that would have otherwise been impossible had I not had plug and charge or a smartphone app. It is also cheaper, generally, if you become a member of a charging network, at least in theory. It's important to give the car time to connect. The connection process and safety checks are actually really complicated. We have like an hour long video on the minutiae because basically we're just those sort of people. But you need to give time to wait until the charger or the car tells you it's charging or that it has failed. If it's still thinking, chances are it's still trying to finish up those connections. But once it is connected, fingers crossed, and you hear those big clunks, you can wander off. Take care of those definitely human organs that you have with some yeah, nutritious bachelor chow or some tasty, nutritious liquid from the Nutramatic machine. And when the car is ready, you can get on your way. So that's all there is to it. It's not really any more complicated than filling up a car with gas. It just takes a moment to get used to it. Although, unlike a gas pump, which you definitely shouldn't walk away from, many people do walk away from charging stations and they go on a long walk. And if anything goes wrong, you want to be fairly close to your car. Because while we would like all the public charging stations to be 100% reliable... <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> Look up Murphy's Law. Thanks for joining me today. And if you've got thoughts, make sure you leave them below in our Discord chat room, or you can reach out to us on Mastodon. Thanks to the amazing list of people scrolling right by on your screen right now. They are some of the more than 1,500 people who help fund this channel every month through Patreon and YouTube, covering our bills, paying our team, and making sure that we can remain 100% independent. If you'd like to join them and see your name listed here, just follow the links below. There are a range of different tiers you can sign up for from as little as $1 a month or, if you pay yearly, just under 
$11 a year. A massive welcome to our newest supporters, Carl B. Knapp, Stoyle Pankoff, Smithers, John Strott, Kelly, Joseph Valentinetti, John Flint, and Nate Fritz. To join the list and get your shout out, become a paid Patreon member for your week of fame. If you'd like to support us with a one-off donation, you'll find links below to make Kofi and Bitcoin donations. And we even have an old-fashioned PO box you can reach us at. The address is also below. And if you're in need of some swag, you'll find our swag store also in the down below. This month, we're campaigning for an end to charging deserts with an amazing new t-shirt design by our in-house artist and animator, Erin. Get yours today by heading to our Redbubble store. We've got some great content coming up, so make sure you're subscribed on Peertube or YouTube and we'll see you soon. We make new videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. If you want more, the mighty algorithm thinks you'll enjoy this video, but we think that this one is also well worth a look. See you soon and as always, keep evolving!